Hi everyone, my name is Jason Orlowski from Osaka University. I'll be co-presenting today with Tim Grabowski, an independent researcher from Switzerland. In this paper, we're really trying to come up with a more biologically plausible approach uh, to the evolution of neural networks, specifically looking at spiking neural networks. In general, the features of most neural networks, including spiking neural networks, are not really well designed for crossover op operations or other genetic option operations in which the networks can share genes or share features or characteristics through subsequent generations. We have several goals in this paper. Uh, first, to build a better neural network that is more compatible uh, with these gene crossover operations. Uh, also, to build a network that better propagates or better emulates neuron propagation, so the sending of signals uh, that present in biology. And lastly, we wanted to test what we built to see if it could solve basic problems and see how uh, an approach like random mutation would compare to uh, sharing genes via crossover operations. So as I mentioned, uh, what we're trying to do here is build a type of spiking neural network that allows for more flexibility in terms of how it can propagate or evolve and also that more closely represent, uh, resembles biological systems in the way that they send electrical impulses or signals. If you look down at the video on the lower left, you'll see a video playing that shows uh, how information is propagated through one of our networks. So each of these uh, dark little bubbles represents a neuron, and the green bubbles represents one of the electrical signals that's propagating through the network. Right now, these green bubbles are slowed down so you can see the effect, um, but we can speed this simulation up so that the, um, these electrical impulses uh, travel as fast as possible through the network. Secondly, in the middle image here, you can see an example of a network structure that we designed to be much more compatible with genetic crossover operations. In particular, each of the positions within the barcode at the bottom of the structure represents a gene within the organism's chromosome. We'll talk later about how this improves the sharing of genetic information within subsequent generations during evolution. And to the right here, you can see sort of the, the metaf metaphorical structure of our uh, network, including uh, an eye or the input layer, intermediary neurons, and also uh, flagella, or neurons that propagate our organisms through space uh, in a simulation that we'll also just talk about in a little bit. So prior work in this area covers quite a few different areas, um, so I'll just get to touch on a couple of them. Um, but one of them is basically emulating or replicating the characteristics of neurons or portions of the brain in order to better represent uh, or create more biologically plausible uh, neural networks. Uh, one of these is called neurogenesis, or basically coming up with methods that can build brains or uh, represent the structure of the brains uh, in better ways. Uh, also, a number of researchers have um, looked at asynchronous firing, so uh, in contrast with neural networks that process layer by layer in a synchronous fashion, um, artificial neural networks, in particular spiking networks, um, such as that of Sabre and Song, uh, focus on how do we uh, allow neurons to fire asynchronously uh, and propagate information through the network in an asynchronous way, uh, much more similar to that of natural neurons. Uh, second. Uh, area in this, uh, or interrelated area, is that of uh, holistic or biological models. Um, so for example, the whole brain connect connectomic architecture by uh, Yamakawa et al. seeks to basically replicate uh, the entire brain structure at a rough level, and uh, then secondly replicate uh, the functions of neurons at lower levels. And each portion of the brain is essentially um, a module that fun functions into this whole brain uh, architecture uh, and each module has its own subsequent um, characteristics and, and features in design. Uh, very closely related to that is artificial embryogeny uh, which essentially attempts to replicate the process uh, that exists in development of the embryo itself. Uh, so replicating uh, morphogenesis or um, the encoding of cells during the uh, development of the embryo um, is also very closely related. And lastly, there's some work that um, attempts to model vision, so um, other systems that are already developed, in particular vision, uh, and basing networks off of uh, that type of biology. So more specifically, uh, since we're coming up with a neural network design that's specific to spiking neural networks, 
there's been quite a lot of work in terms of um, describing or studying neural networks, spiking neural networks, and how they function. This ranges from studying the dynamics of individual neurons uh, in sparsely connected ne neural networks to methods for representing uncertainty uh, in neurons, as well as modeling the stochastic processes involved in transmitting information over the synapse. And last, I want to introduce this concept of genetic crossover. Crossover essentially represents how chromosomes exchange bits and pieces of information between each other. So when you have one chromosome that splits, or two chromosomes that want to share information, they split and recombine a piece of each into a new chromosome. Within genetic crossover operations, there are a number of different types that have been applied to neural networks already. Um, algebraic crossovers, uh, rank-based selection, and quite a few other methods. However, one of the problems with these cross crossover methods is that they are not really applicable or they don't work well with spiking neural networks. So one of our motion motivations behind this work was to come up with a better way or a better network design in which we could conduct crossovers and study how crossovers might affect, uh, let's say, the evolution or uh, populations of uh, neural networks that are solving particular tasks. Uh, and then we also wanted to compare within the space um, how a an approach like random mutation, so just um, randomly mutating genes and selecting one of the best offspring from a particular group, I uh, wanted to see how does that random mutation compare to if we introduce genetic crossover operations, uh, which will converge on a, a local minimum and maximum more quickly, and are there any other observable tendencies that might result during the evolution process. Before we talk about the actual evolution, just to recap some of the features of our network. Uh, so one, it's asynchronous. Information travels between neurons in an asynchronous manner. One neuron can be firing while another is waiting for information. These are arranged spatially, so they can be located in 3D space. Actually, there's no particular um, array that they need to adhere to. Uh, we use physics-based simulation for the electrical impulses, so they, uh, they transmit over space and time. We also provide a number of visualizations to see not only the impulses, but which impulses might have contributed to a particular output. We also developed a representation that improves compatibility with crossover operations. I'll hand it off to Tim for the next slide. Our framework makes use of evolutionary and genetic optimization approaches in order to automatically derive network structures. In particular, we consider random mutations as well as different kinds of genetic crossover. For measuring the aptitude of a given network, scenario-specific costs and objective functions are used that depend on the given task which a network has to solve. In order to be able to apply genetic optimization to a neural network, we had to decide on a genetic representation for encoding network structures. For this, we first consider the adjacency matrix representing connections between neurons. We then augment the adjacency matrix so that the elements of the matrix encode connection-specific aspects, such as whether a given connection involves excitatory or inhibitory neurons. Finally, the rows of the augmented adjacency matrix are concatenated, yielding the genetic string representation of the network. With the genetic representation in place, we decided to use different crossover techniques during the genetic optimization. First, we have the discrete crossover, which for a given gene position, randomly picks the child's gene from one of the corresponding genes in the chromosomes of the parents. The framework also makes use of the single-point crossover, where subsequences of the parent's chromosomes are concatenated depending on the position of the crossover point. We also experimented with a custom selective crossover, which promotes genes corresponding to neuron connections that contributed to network output in strong candidates. For the random mutation approach, we make use of four different kinds of mutations, which are adding and removing of neurons, as well as adding and removing of neuron connections. We then applied our framework to optimize networks for two different scenarios. One is the food foraging scenario, where small organisms navigate through a two-dimensional arena, searching for food which is represented by a light source that moves randomly. In this scenario, the success of candidate organisms is measured by how close they manage to get towards the light source. In the second scenario, we wanted to see whether our framework can be used to automatically derive networks that are able to recognize images. For this, Candidate networks had to classify images showing digits from the MNIST dataset 
In this scenario, the cost function contains two subterms, the proximity term, which rewards correct classification, and the coverage term, which incentivizes leveraging as many image pixels as possible. And with that, back to Jason. After building these two scenarios, we then wanted to test whether our neural network that would actually function and solve the problems of food foraging and image recognition. Moreover, we wanted to test in detail whether crossover operations uh, would compare to random mutations during the evolutionary process. To ensure that our spiking neural networks worked properly, we inserted our organism, organisms, or our, our networks, into the simulation scenario that you see here in the lower left-hand corner. This is the same scenario described previously. And what we wanted to do is to test to see if, how well these uh, organisms would evolve over time and whether or not they would converge and actually learn to forage for food. As you can see in the video in the lower left, organisms are basically placed randomly throughout the environment. And as time goes on, the best portion of the population, the top 10%, are uh, cloned and mutated, and the lower portion of the population are removed from the simulation. This process is repeated for a number of epochs, and we began to see over uh, by about 20 epochs that a few of the organisms, a few of the neural networks are actually starting to move towards the food. In the video on the lower right, you can see the internal structure of each of the organisms evolving over time. And as you can see, it becomes more and more complex and eventually connects to the proper, uh, the proper flagella, the proper neurons that propel the organism through the environment, and food foraging behavior occurs. We'll show more examples of this later. We also applied a similar technique to our neural networks in a 3D environment. Uh, here you can see the neural network with the input uh, as the blue layer, and we tested on the MNIST data set. Again, the goal here is not to outperform existing methods, but just to make sure that uh, our physics-based simulation actually works similar and has similar performance to other prior methods. In the video on the left, you can see the network evolving over time, creating new connections to between inputs and outputs. In the video on the right, you can see the resulting network. And we've slowed the simulation down so you can see the path directly from the input through all the intermediary neurons to the output neurons uh, on the right, which are in green, and represent the digits from 0 to 9. Using our infrastructure, we were able to get accuracies over 56%. And while these don't really compare to uh, state-of-the-art approaches, they get 90 plus percent. Uh, this showed that our approach can be used to solve not only food foraging tasks, but also image recognition tasks. What we really wanted to study in this paper was the difference between random mutation approaches and the genetic crossover approaches that we had built. We tested this on the food foraging tasks and allowed populations of both 10 and 30 organisms to run for 150 generations. We repeated this process 20 times and aggregated the results in the, the graph that you see here. The orange lines represent the random mutation approach and the blue lines represent the genetic crossover approach. As you can see, the crossover approach generates better results more quickly but degrades over time. In contrast, the random mutations are slower but provide a more stable population over time. Additionally, when we observed these populations and their simulations, we saw that for crossover operations, several organisms would either leave the scenario or leave the simulation space very quickly or uh, completely run off the board. And we think this negatively affected results. To test this, uh, we just took the top half of both populations and reran the simulations. On this slide, you can see the results of that experiment, uh, which includes just the top 50% of the population for each generation. As you can see, there's no degradation over time, uh, but the same tendencies occur where the crossover operations uh, increase more quickly in the initial states, but the random mutation outperforms in the long run. Lastly, on the left-hand side here, you, you can see uh, the simulation and the population over approximately 50 epochs. And the interesting thing is that the behavior that emerged in most of these generations, no matter how many times we ran the simulations, actually resembles the behavior, behavior of small organisms, single-celled organisms, uh, in particular dinoflagellates, who forage for food in the natural uh, world. You can see an example of that here on the right-hand video. In summary, we had two major findings of, in this paper. One, that coded layouts can help improve the compatibility with genetic crossover operations. Secondly, we saw that crossover operations sometimes resulted in organisms that had severely deteriorated genes or performance that was highly negative.
This suggests that some poor genes can remain in a population, while the top half of the population still improves performance over time. Our next steps are to improve the visualization and allow users to both view and manipulate the, these networks in virtual reality. And lastly, we plan to open source this code so other researchers can build their own network variants and also test new types of crossover operations. Thanks again for listening, and feel free to reach out with any questions.